Scott. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Scott Luton and Kevin L. Jackson with you here on Supply Chain. Now, welcome to today's live stream. Kevin, how are we doing? Hello, hello. Uh, welcome, everyone. No, I'm not doing well, I tell you. Um, I, uh, the other day, I normally, like, you know, I'll, I'll work at home, like, just about everyone, right? And I take lunch, and I go fix my lunch, and I go out of my, uh, have a screen uh, house in the back of my, uh, uh, screen porch in the back of my house. I go out there, sit down, relax, sort of, you know, unwind for about an hour or so before I go back to the grind. Paint, paints a nice picture. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, you know, so... Early this week, I, during my regular go out on the right, and it was cold. I mean, it was cold. <laughs> I, you know, I was out there in my shorts and a nice, you know, polo shirt. What's happening? The weather is changing. I don't like that. <laughs> Man, we can't wait. The weather's starting to change around here. It's nice and crisp. Football weather, you know, of course, playoff baseball weather. We're excited yeah. about what uh, Atlanta's doing. So leaves um, are falling. Yes, leaves are falling. Dogs get frisky when it's cold <laughs> outside. I don't know about yours, but regardless, um, I love that picture you painted, Kevin. And I you tell you, cold in Atlanta. Come on, <laughs> y'all. It gets a little colder where you are, but as beautiful <laughs> of a scene as you just painted, we've got a beautiful show teed up here today. So today, oh, yeah. Kevin, is the digital transformers version of the supply chain buzz. And, you know, it's always a big deal when Kevin joins us, but we've doubled down, folks. We have got an, uh, uh, a big name from industry. Ray Wong is joining us, author of the bestseller, Everybody Wants to Rule the World. I've got my copy here. I have been following and reading and taking uh, Ray's advice for years. Uh, he, he is a, he's a fixture, and he's smart, too. <laughs> You're right, and he's a great uh, follow. If you're looking for great people to follow across socials, especially on Twitter, hey, check mm -hmm. out Ray. You you will not, uh, you will uh, learn a lot by the hour sometimes. Uh, but Kevin, are you pretty mm -hmm. excited? We got we got to say hello to a few folks in a moment. But are you pretty excited about today's show? Oh yeah, I, I got my questions lined up here. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we've got a big show. We're gonna be talking digital transformation. We're gonna be talking about supply chains today but more importantly, tomorrow and a lot more. So stay tuned. Get your folks. We want to hear from you. Get your comments ready. We'd love to hear what's on your mind here today as we kick off uh, the third week of October. Today's October 18th. So let's do a um, let's pay the bills a bit and let's share some upcoming uh, events. Folks, we invite you to join us on October 26th as we host a conversation via webinar around successfully navigating the supply chain squeeze kevin the supply mm -hmm. chain squeeze not just in fourth quarter but beyond so join us on october 26 as we host ups crocs and sunjoy uh for what promises to be a very enlightening conversation and then kevin on yeah. november 9th uh we're gonna be talking about uh kind of what we're gonna be talking about today supply chain of 2022 and beyond oh, Focus. Laura, right? that's right laura cesare the one and only oh, yeah. focused on resiliency kevin and agility mm -hmm. of course we hear that basically every hour, don't we? Well, Laura, you know, she uh, does. She just released her uh, study of the uh, top supply chain. And uh, I, I guess she's going to talk about what they, they've learned in this as well, right? Uh, well, between her and Madoff, I'll tell you, folks, you're going to earn a, basically a college degree in an hour. Uh, this conversation <laughs> coming up on November 9th. So join us for that. And of course, it's free to join our webinar. So we'd invite you to come out. All right, so Kevin, before I want to I want to touch on um, some big news that you were a part of uh, right before we bring on Ray Wong today, and folks, stay tuned for a great conversation. But let's say hello to a few folks before we do all of that. Uh, man, room is filling up here today. Uh, let's start, Peter Bole, all night and all day. Great to see you here, Peter. Uh, now, Kevin, Peter's golf game is strong. It is strong. Ooh. I bet he's like a two handicapper. I bet. You know, when I go golfing, I always have at least three extra balls in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is per hole for me. I am not. I lose, I lose plenty of golf balls, but great to see you here, Peter. Uh, let's see. Emmanuel is with us uh, from uh, 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 Lagos, yeah. Nigeria. Great to see you, Emmanuel, uh, via LinkedIn. Looking forward to hearing what you're saying. Uh, Gene Pledger is back 
from a vacation in lower Alabama. That's the LA he's referring to. <laughs> uh, Gene, great to see you. Uh, old TV, Tom Valentine is with us here today via LinkedIn. Great to see you, Tom. What's going on with you and your neck of the woods? Uh, Ogun, let's see here. Oguntawa, uh, Oguntawo, I think if I said that right, close. Let me know. We, it's really important to get folks' name right. Uh, let me know uh, if uh, you have any helpful tips as we pronounce folks' name from around the world. But great to have you here today. You looking what, for. Um, yeah, I really like shouting out to Nigeria. I, tell you, I have a lot of followers, digital transformers. There's a lot of uh, downloads from, from Nigeria. Really? Yeah. Well, He's a huge, he says, huge fan of the show. And I bet he's a big fan of Kevin L. Jackson, too. So great to see you here, uh, Leke from uh, Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, let's see here. David is back with us, Kevin. Mm -hmm. David, hey, how David. you doing? Great to see you. Uh, Kevin, do you ever do any off roading? You know what? Um, no, but I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> I like how we get to the, uh, to the quick answer. Uh, uh, but well, David, has a Jeep, four by four, uh, weekends, mud, and you name it, and more. And then, of course, well, he spends. I've been doing a lot of, um, uh, I ride on a, a um, Nordic track bike, right? And for the past three weeks, I've been riding virtually in, uh, in the Canyonlands Park and uh, Archers out, out in uh, Utah. And, you know, I see all of the off road vehicles. Just having a great time in, in uh, with you know with the uh, Colorado River and Grand all it, it's just amazing. That's why I really want to. I want to try that out. I want to go out in Canyonlands and, and, and ride a four wheeler. We, we gotta we gotta send a camera crew with you, and we document all of that, <laughs> uh, Kevin. Uh, have a new reality show to add to your your growing <laughs> growing uh, collection. Um, let's see here. Shashi, great to see you here. Appreciate it. Yes, you're going to have lots of inspirational and informative insights from Kevin and Ray here today. And we want to hear from you. Let us know what you're thinking as we tackle uh, a variety of topics here. And David says, come on up, Kevin. He'll take you out four by four uh, oh, off-road. Okay. Can't wait. <laughs> all right. So with all of that said, and sorry we couldn't get to everybody, uh, but again, we want to hear from you today as we walk through a variety of topics here. But Kevin, Right before we bring on our uh, special guest here today, I want to bring this story back in because you've been in some big news related to Galveston down in Texas. Tell us about this. Well, yeah. So what you see there is the 1861 Galveston Customs House. So uh, back in the Civil War days, the very last battle of the Civil War was in uh, just outside of Galveston, Texas. And the uh, general uh, told, basically emancipated the last group of slaves mm -hmm. there in Galveston and went around the city making that, that announcement. And this was one of the, uh, it's one of only two physical locations that still exist where they made the uh, announcement. Um, and we're, uh, I'm with a group here in Washington, D.C., and we are purchasing this building that you see here to, for a Juneteenth museum because that was the birthplace of Juneteenth, uh, June 19th, the day that the last slaves were emancipated in, in the United States. So uh, we made front page news this week. I, I'm excited. That that is outstanding. Well, um, I can't wait to hear a lot more about that uh, this uh, critical project. And of course, we want to celebrate as uh, as a museum eventually opens. I think next year, Kevin, if I understand yes. the time frame we're, right, is that right? We're looking to open uh, Juneteenth, twenty twenty two. Awesome. Well, we're going to celebrate with you uh, and uh, mark what is an, an incredible historical. Um, uh, part of our collective history. So mm -hmm. thanks for what you do, Kevin. And we'll have to interview you, you and that investment team soon and, and uh, learn more, a lot more about y'all's vision. All right. Thanks. You bet. Okay. So with no further ado, uh, I want to bring on our special guest here today. So as I mentioned, uh, Ray Wong will be joining us, principal analyst and founder at Constellation Research, author, again, of the best-selling book, Everybody Wants to Rule the World, Surviving and Thriving in a World of Digital Giants. Welcome in, Ray Wong. 
Hey, Ray, good afternoon. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. What's going on with you guys? <laughs> Staying from busy. The, the other side of the swoosh from the other side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, yeah. Kevin, you're letting the cat out of the back. Ray, tell everybody where you are. I'm in Dubai, and uh, one of the things that I'm doing out here is checking out the Expo 2020. Lots of conversations about sustainability, lots of conversations about um, what's happening next, and uh, you know, a lot of insight, right? So catching that, and of course, we've got a couple clients out here, and uh, we're doing some conversations around the book and stuff around leadership. Man, I love it. Uh, and I bet you're lucky to get a couple hours of sleep each night with all the stuff you've got cooking, huh? <laughs> this is a tough time zone. <laughs> this is a really <laughs> tough time zone because you work the rest of the world hours and you work what's out here as well. So if you forget to take some time off. It is brutal. So oh, yeah. we're going to have some work with the, with the kingdom. And I was you know working all night and working all day. <laughs> wow. Um, yep. We're, we're going to have to connect exactly with our friend, like uh, Kim Winter out in Dubai. Dubai is such a fascinating, innovative uh, part of the world. And we look forward to hearing more about your, your, your travels there. We'll probably touch on some of that today, Ray, and then uh, we'll have to keep our finger on the pulse of uh, your global travels. So great to have you here today. Well, hey, thanks for having me and a uh, big fan of the show. So, well, thank you. All right. So Kevin, uh, yeah. with uh, you and Ray, we want to kind of walk through some of the leading headlines across the world of supply chain with a really heavy digital transformers flavor. So I want to start, Kevin, see if I can get my, my graphics ready to go here today. We're going to start with uh, big news when it comes to automation and global supply chain as Berkshire Gray and Atos, Atos are partnering. Right. Tell, tell yeah. us more about it, Kevin. So, you know, uh, you know, I talk about digital transformation but one of the key aspects of digital transformation is robotics, right? And uh, Berkshire Gray and Atos really have teamed up together because they see digital transformation and robotics as two sides of the same coin, especially in the supply chain world because everything is on demand. So they're, they're working together to provide a real holistic, flexible, and a cost-effective warehouse automation to support supply chain transformation solutions. Uh, and this is the meet, you know, the high need uh, and the required velocity as we transition in this post-COVID world. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, Kevin, you're so right. right. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, if you look at what Amazon's doing on the warehouse side, mm -hmm. the level of automation that's required, the, the volumes that are there, I mean, just take the longshoremen on every port. I mean, we got to get as much of that automated. We got to get the warehouse automated. We've got to get transit automated, right? That's why everyone's looking at autonomous trucks going coast to coast. Uh, that's why the big battle is uh, between Volvo, Tesla, and others in the long, in the long haul, uh, because there's not enough workers, right? And we've got so much material that we're moving and we're not doing a good job manually and we're not even doing a good job from a safety record and we're also not doing a good job from an environmental perspective mm. we're at a huge backlog at um all of the ports because there's not enough drivers right um and all the backlog and from the ships is because there's not enough longshoremen you know it, it, think, it is really bad right uh, of course we uh, don't don't have enough equipment uh, the infrastructure and and the uh, transfer points or, or a lot of congestion there. Um, we've got kind of a perfect storm in many ways, but I, I want to add to this, um, you know, I, lo I love the, how this partnership, because you've got the technology side, then you, have, then you have the expertise of implementing it, right? And training organizations how to use it. Because as powerful as automation is, you know, implementing it and then managing it can be really challenging. I point to, there's lots of case studies out there, Ray and Kevin, as you know, mm -hmm. rent the runway very public problem back in 2019 where a little software glitch, you know, shut down the operation for several days, uh, missed oh, yeah. orders, missed subscribers and angry customers. So Ray, you're nodding your head. Automation can be tricky, right? You know, automation is hard, right? And if we look at automation, like the way we look at um, autonomous vehicles, there's five levels, right? There's basic automation and it's like cruise control, but you still got to steer. Maybe you got to brake. Uh, you probably do have to brake, right? And then we get level two, which is kind of like, you know, there, there's some level of like, you know, human directed, which is not bad, right? That's like right. a Tesla autopilot. The car will drive itself. 
But if there's no car at a stop light, it will run through the stoplight. So you still have to jump in, okay, just a little bit. And then we get machine intervention. And that's when, you know, you're backing up and it goes beep, beep, beep. Okay, what happened? Right? The brakes <laughs> in, there's someone behind you, there's like a ball, you know, there's like another car, right? That's machine intervention. Like we're somewhere between two and three right now, but we can get to four, right? And four works like this, right? You go to every major airport, these automated trains work on themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about the history of train accidents, it's crazy. Like conductor fell asleep, conductor was drunk, conductor was on a mobile phone, right? It's all human error. Mm. There's very little error in the airports, right? I mean, there's, I never hear about airplane, airport trains crashing into each other, carrying people, <laughs> right? So, so we get to that level and at some point we'll get to full automation where humans are optional, but we're somewhere between level two and level three in most cases. And in the warehouse, given what you're pick packing and shipping, it's hard. Right. There's some things that just don't fit. Right. They're all exceptions. And it's the exceptions that are just brutal. Right. Even if you're 95 percent accurate, that, those last five percent will take up probably 80 percent of your time. And that's what people are trying to solve at this moment. And they wow. need massive amounts of data, massive amounts of volume to figure, figure that out. Um, that's, that's why Amazon has a massive lead. DHL has a really good lead. Expo Logistics has a great lead. Right. But everybody else, like what are they going to do? Right. And, and that's why this partnership is interesting. I love that, Ray. All right, so Kevin, a uh, quick response, and I'm going to go to some of the comments we've got. Well, it's kind of interesting that people complain about robotics and robots are going to take all the jobs away from humans, right? But now when there's just a shortage of humans to take a lot of jobs, we're in the middle of the great resignation where everybody is quitting their jobs. So, so humans don't seem to be too smart if they're quitting right at the time where robots are primed to take over. <laughs> <laughs> great great so opportunities, true. right? All this technology innovation is, is cr creating a lot of great opportunities for professionals to continue to advance and learn new yeah. things and, and try new things. Um, I want to, uh, so Tom Valentine, we mentioned him earlier, busy helping existing and new companies with their logistics challenges. And as Ray and Kevin points out, no shortage of logistics challenges. Hello, Matthias. Great to see you there from St. Augustine, beautiful city in Florida uh, via LinkedIn. Great to see you. David says, welcome, Ray. See, we're rolling out the red carpet, uh, carpet for one Ray Wong here today. Shashi is also from Dubai. Uh, nice to see Ray. Expo 2020 is one of the great events here. So uh, the world's really a small place once you start peeling the, the onion back. Eric also reminds us. That it's, it's enough. Well, he says it's enough drivers, but not enough chassis uh, uh, and chassis is part of that equipment. I, uh, Ray and Kevin, speaking of chassis that we've heard uh, someone reported on our show a few weeks back that it's, there's an eight year manufacturing backlog backlog for wow. chassis. How about that? It's true on the uh, heavy trucks. There, there's that issue, but but actually, what's really concerning right now is it's three fronts. One is school lunch programs aren't getting food, right? Um, the supply chains for grocery are so behind at the moment. If you looked on TV, you'll see in every city that the, sh the shops are bare in many wow. grocery stores at the moment, right? And the third piece is, and this is the crazy one, there are people who've shipped goods to other people to pick up those goods that all are bankrupt. What are we going to have? What are we going to do? Like mystery box container? Like, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, what's that show jail. where like you go out? Yeah. What's that? What's that show where they go out and find these mystery things? They go dig it up and, you know, they go and see what's in these boxes. It's going to be with containers. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> wow. It is a unique time. Uh, all right. So this first story we're talking about, Berkshire Gray and Atos are partnering, uh, courtesy of our friends over at Supply Chain Brain. So a lot of good stuff there. Uh, Kevin and Ray, I think. They get uh, your rubber stamp approval. So we'll see how that uh, plays out as they look mm -hmm. to tackle some of the challenges we're speaking of. All right, let's move right along because we want to talk, talk about this piece of research that comes to us from Accenture talking about how today's supply chains, Kevin, uh, right. you know, no shortage of, of challenges and innovation to talk about, but how all that's got to evolve to serve the supply chains of tomorrow. Tell us, tell us more. Well, one of the things that's important to note is that nobody talked about supply chains <laughs> for the longest time, right? Because they were just in the background. It, it, they all worked. Uh, you always had things on the shelf. And, and then when the pandemic hit, supply chain became front page news because it started failing. In fact, Factiva published an article saying that articles on supply chain itself were up 
45% year over year in 2020, because everyone started talking about news was just dominated, not dominated by stories and pictures of empty shelves and at the retailers and idle automotive assembly lines because they couldn't get parts and containers waiting to be unloaded. And what Accenture did in their study, they were basically saying, well, what does the supply chain managers, designers need to do to fix this issue? So they came up with really three points. They said that supply chains need to adapt to their customer's value while continually decreasing the resources required to deliver it. Uh, Ray was just talking about, you know, people paying people to deliver boxes that were delivered by other people, right? These middlemen really need to, need to get rid of them because that just increases cost. Supply chains need to be more resilient, okay? They must protect their customers, companies, and their partners from the supply and demand shocks. One of the things we talked about before is that a lot of this quote automation and data that people are using for artificial intelligence, they are looking at data from the past, thinking that that data could help um, them manage the future. And that is so wrong, <laughs> that is so false. You need visibility into the supply chain in order to manage today. You need that visibility of yesterday, not 10, 15 years ago. And finally, supply chains have to take this on their shoulder. They have to be more responsible. They have to, they have to operate in ways that are not only good for the bottom line, but good for the planet and society. And they need to establish and maintain and enhance trust with all the stakeholders that depend on the supply chain. So this, this is a tall order, but it's about time. <laughs> well, excellent. So, Ray, uh, there's a lot that Kevin just shared there. Where, where do you want to respond? Yeah, no, I, I think it's really important to think about this uh, in, in, in the holistic way, right? If you're a company, the front end is really your orders and your commerce systems, the back end is supply chain. People have optimized their supply chain, therefore there's nothing to sell, right? If you optimize your orders, there's nothing to deliver, right? And so, so these have always been hand in hand. That's why order management is really important because it brings those two areas together. And so what we've learned is supply chains are gonna be massively disrupted um, and in constant chaos for quite some time because we don't have the demand signals down, right? Right. We're using historical data and trying to forecast off that, but the demand signals have changed and we're not sure exactly what changed. And so that's what people are trying to fine tune at the moment. But the other piece that's really important is we're going from, you know, just in time to just in case, right? And, and that requires a capital investment, which means inventory costs are going to go up, which means CFOs are going to be unhappy. But the agile supply chains we thought we had are pretty brittle, right? And, and what we actually need now is, is that it's like par levels, right? We need reserve capacity, right. uh, and 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 we never we never accounted for it, which means the way that we built these long ass supply chains are pretty much going to be broken down to nearshoring, and and things are going to come back uh, closer to to you know where your production is going to be. Just like when we looked at additive manufacturing and three D printing, that's that was going to change those supply chains. Uh, the other piece is really. Um, data-driven approaches are powering the future, right? Everything is really about grabbing those data signals. And what we haven't done a good job with is, and, and I'm not harping on the software vendors, but if I was going to build a brand new software company, I'd give away the software for free. The transactions are free, but you pay for the insight because I need more data. I mean, there's not enough data. Everyone's going, oh, I got a really good algorithm. And I'm just like, that algorithm's okay. You just don't have enough data. If you had more data, you'd actually get better precision. And, and what you're missing is the precision. And back to what Kevin's saying, the false positives and false negatives are like, they're freaking all over the map. That's why people can't forecast. So, and then the other piece is the automation. We, we have a concept called decision velocity. It's super important, right? You and I make a decision per second. It takes us 
I don't know, a week to get out of management committee, a quarter, <laughs> could be even longer. Who, who knows, right? I mean, it could take forever, right? But machines are making decisions 100 times per second, 1,000 times per second. It's that algorithm that allows people to actually react more quickly. And what you're seeing at places like Amazon is, and Alibaba and JD is that they're getting really good with their algorithms, right? They know exactly what they need to get, get a delivery. And, and the more sensing data and delivery times that they get, it gets even better, right? They can tell you that prediction pretty well. And then this is the part Kevin's all about, right? But he's right. Blockchain and smart contracts are going to speed up efficiency, right? Yeah. There's so much crap. Like how much facts and like, I don't know. You can still walk around with a clipboard and look important like on the floor. But seriously, <laughs> like what the hell is this, right? So, right. So, and the last piece is uh, really sustainability. I mean, that's the piece that's missing in this article. We should be talking about where sustainability, circular economy and other pieces are going to play a role. So great point. Hey, really quick. I want to bring in a couple comments here and then I'm going to uh, talk about Everlane for a second. Tom Valentine Ooh. makes a great point, which I, I generally agree with. Automation is not necessarily here to replace humans in supply chain, but it's being expedited because humans are not willing to do the specific job function. We've seen a lot of that, right? Yes. Folks just leaving uh, their jobs because they're, they're tired of treatment. They're tired of the, the, the nature of the job or, or tired it's of the pandemic. Job. Yeah, that's right. Uh, David uh, agrees with Tom. Then I'm going to also come back up to Owalabi. Great to have you here today, Owalabi. He says, digit, digit, digitization, try to say that seven times fast. <laughs> digitization and supply chain management has jumped up post the climax of COVID-19 as startups and logistics is growing day by day here in Nigeria, he says. They are basically digital. As the pandemic clearly showed the world, a lot could be done without physical contact. It's just the beginning as many people are quitting their jobs to set up their logistics outfits, yes. mostly in last mile delivery. Love that. Um, okay. And really quick, I want to add to the points you're making. Uh, two quick data points. Uh, according to this research from Accenture, 53% of CEOs are allocating funding to drive supply chain innovation, only 53%. And it gets worse. Only 49% of CEOs are allocating their top talent to supply chain. That's a challenge. We, we got to have the bucks, got to have the talent. And then, uh, Everlane, a neat story. Here's a, here's a good, here's a good news. Mm -hmm. Everlane is a retailer that offers a wide range of uh, clothing, primarily apparel, but a big part of their culture is what they call radical transparency. Get this, Kevin and Ray, y'all might already know. They investigate and audit each factory they work with on things like fair wages, reasonable hours, and the environment and offer all that information to Everlane customers. I've read, I, I hadn't seen it yet, but I've read it's a one click, to, uh, uh, their customers can uh, one click away from peering into the factories that I would argue is a big part of supply chains of tomorrow. But Kevin, get all you right. to respond. So that's all part of building trust. And as Ray talked about blockchain and the importance of data, well, you have to have trust in that data. You have to understand the providence of that data. You have to understand source of that data. Um, and similarly, when you are su supplying products and services to your customers, your customers want to understand your providence of those products, okay? So providing that visibility uh, builds trust between a customer and their um, uh, uh, the, the store. And the store needs to build trust across their ecosystem by using verifiable, immutable data. Um, and this is why like blockchain is so important to across every industry. It's that, it's that trust, is that data that has to be rebuilt. Right, well with trust, you know, Ray, you mentioned uh, decision velocity, I think. Hey, if you trust in the data and you trust in the decisions that are to be made, you can move a lot faster, right? way faster. Mm -hmm. You're definitely going to move much quicker. Um, but but I think, you know, the, the whole point of smart contracts and the ability to get these smart contracts to work is the fact mm -hmm. that, you know, everything's established, right? You, you've got that in place. It can be anonymous. Your, you know, zero knowledge proofs are in place. You get some really cool, you know, contracts that are demand sensing, demand pricing that adjust on their own. I mean, it's it's beautiful, right? I mean, when you look at like trade lens with IBM Maersk, right? That's yeah. kind of an idea of what could happen, right? And, and to me, that's super powerful. And, and this is really, you know, some of the things that we're looking 
looking at these, what we call data-driven digital networks. These are the multi-sided platforms that are trading on insights and data. And, and those insights and data become important because that's that's my pricing optimization. That's my ability to put up a bid. That's my you know supplier, uh, vendor's procurement, like reliability score, right? You know, I'm ranking, rating them uh, all the time. And it's also my ability to figure out, holy crap, we are missing some rare earth materials. How's that gonna work? Oh, gosh. <laughs> right? or, we're Not short good. on chips. Yeah, we're short on chips. Like, yeah. Yeah. Transparency and visibility into the supply chain, right? <laughs> so it's, I want to touch on something. Uh, Eric, both of y'all have spoken to this. And of course, this this article here today, we're talking about tomorrow's supply chains. So Eric says, many people have theorized that trucks will be fully automated first. I beg to differ because the first level two trucks are just now being released from Freightliner, for example. This means the technology continues to be put into the cars first. Your thoughts, uh, Kevin, let's start with you. So um, I, I think the the industry itself, transportation as vertical has been slow to uh, adopt technology. Similarly, distribution has been slow to adopt technology. Things like um, uh, RFI for tracking items and, and goods and pallets uh, could have been deployed years ago. But the, the battle uh, between, I guess, the uh, unions and, and having humans to do this work versus being more efficient and collecting data with technology has it just prevented that. And I think we're at a tipping point. Ray? Yeah, I think we're actually going to be much closer uh, than, than people realize. Uh, trucks are really important, right? And they're going to be the long haul routes, the hub to hub. They're not going to be the short haul, like last mile driving. Um, so if you're going across any of the uh, even number roads uh, east west in the US, um, you're going to see some of these automated trucks that are popping up. So Tesla definitely has things going. Volvo definitely has things going. Um, you got a company called Embark that's doing some really interesting things. Uh, and, and they're basically trying to figure out how to automate the freeway part of the journey. That, mm -hmm. That's the only part that they matter. Daimler's trying to get into the space. You know, we see them popping in um, with their autonomous trucks. I think they're a little behind, uh, but, you know, I mean, they'll, they'll all get there, right? But the question is, like, who's buying these trucks and what's going to happen? And you have to basically look at, you know, like Amazon's basically buying tons of these trucks, right? And corporate fleets are buying tons of these trucks uh, because they're afraid that they're going to get into, like, carbon emission issues. And so they want electric trucks and they want automated. And those two things work hand in hand. Volvo is doing really good jobs with their automated trucks platforms. And that's something to watch uh, because they've got that in place. And then uh, a couple other ones, you know, there's Ike and some other smaller ones that are in the play. So That's the long haul. You're right. The long haul is going to really... I like long haul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we've been talking about uh, this article here from Accenture, research from Accenture. Uh, Y'all check that out, Resilient and Responsible Tomorrow's Supply Chains. So I'm going to pause here for a second, Kevin. We had a little little uh, technology snafu. We'll see if we can't get Ray back in a second. Okay. Uh, but in the meantime, though, and it looks like we have got Ray back. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I didn't pay my I didn't pay my hotel bill. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking 10 megs up, 10 megs down, and they don't like it. Right. So. You have to go to the next plan, huh? <laughs> I had to I level up. I want to share. I want to share two quick comments and get both of y'all to respond uh, just before we go to our third and final article, and then we're going to talk about Ray, your book here today. But Tom says uh, he's talking about the administration does not need to put more regulations and restrictions, but to work as a tri partnership with the private sector, educational system, and the government to solve the numerous issues we're facing. He's kind of alluding to that supply chain czar we've heard about possibly being implemented. And then, uh, and I'm not sure if uh, Amanda or Clay or Ali, if you can let us know uh, who this LinkedIn user is, but they say uh, supply chain visibility, as simple as it sounds, lots of organizations do not have it. Hence, yeah. we don't know where to start to change or to, or the fix the problem. That's an excellent point. So Ray, but I'll start five with you. control towers. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see here. And that was uh, Santosh. Thank you for that comment, Santosh. So Ray, I want to get you to respond to either uh, the challenge of real supply chain visibility or um, the role between the private sector working with the government and the educational systems to move forward. Address either either one of those, uh, if you would, Ray. 
look, I'm going to bash free market capitalist. Um, and I think it's basically a demand issue. So, you know, there's not enough people. I mean, you can look all around the world. Everybody's the same trouble. You know, if you're in like the UK, the lorry drivers aren't delivering petro, therefore the lines are so full, right? And so everywhere we've got this issue in terms of, yes. are we paying the right prevailing wages? Um, are they matching to what people are looking for? Is it, you know, do the people really take the great, great resignation as Kevin was talking about? I mean, that's, it's happening, right? So people right. are reevaluing their jobs, but but you have people like that were in the airline industry that quit and they're now driving trucks, right? right. So there's there's a whole bunch of shifts that are going on. And and I think that's that's the thing we have to look at. It's It's understanding that demand cycle, adding more government isn't going to help, right? Uh, unless they have the data. And I really doubt that they have the data. So no, that's, that's what I'm worried about. But if the private sector provides the data, puts it up so that we actually have larger sets of data to look at patterns, then I can see that private par public partnership working. And, and I yes. hope that's where we end up. It's almost like Maslow's uh, 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 hierarchy. hierarchy of needs is yeah. changing in, in front of our eyes. So, Kevin, uh, if you would uh, either respond to Ray or, or the comments we heard just there from the skybox. Well, actually, I believe education is key, but it's not just education and education vertical. Education in the commercial world and, yes. and most importantly, in the government world. I mean, people think they know everything, but they know everything from... 20, 30 years ago, it doesn't apply to today. So people really have to understand. They have to understand the new models. They have to understand the power of data. They got to know what data is actually available. And that takes education. So, uh, and let me correct myself. I think I said Maslow. I think I was combining Maslow and Pavlov. <laughs> 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 yep. It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. <laughs> Y'all get the point, though. Uh, really, the motivations and incentives, and, and uh, there's a great psychology study, I'm sure, that's going to be coming out. Um, okay. Yes. So, for the sake of time, uh, I want to move right along to our next uh, story here. Let me pop uh -huh. that up. Uh, now, with this one, we're talking about what 2021 has taught us about, especially about digital transformation and what successful digital transformation is going to be fueled by in 2022 and beyond. So Kevin, tell us more here. Well, it's two things. First of all, uh, Ray was talking about how this is everywhere. So I want to point out that this article uh, came from the United Kingdom, right? Talking about what's, what's driving business growth and recovery in the United Kingdom and it is digital transformation. So the, the question is, what are the top five trends in digital transformation? Number one is data, but using oh, yeah. data as a quote, creative material. Business leaders really need to recognize the advantages of data-driven approaches to improving what their customer experience are and their strategic roadmap for going forward. So first of all, data is a creative material, right? Second, the online business models. I mean, the internet is not going away and the value, the velocity of commerce that's been delivered by the internet is going to continue to increase. So these new online models will drive growth. And as, this, as these things grow and, you know, global commerce is going to remain global. All, I mean, all this talk about onshoring and reshoring, that doesn't mean we will not have a global economy. We will still have a global economy and it's going to accelerate, which means faster decisions and those decisions need data. Third, there has to be a strong focus on resilient supply chains. So how do you get resilient supply chains? By having visibility from yesterday so you can deliver today and being able to use that data to respond to demands of today so that you can deliver tomorrow. Once again, it's all about data and rapidity of decisions. Fourth, artificial intelligence. Why? Because people are too slow. It takes, <laughs> right? It take, may take them a second to make a decision, but then a whole quarter to get it through the um, board of directors, right? So they're going to give it all to the artificial intelligence so that they can make these decisions fast, 
but they don't have to be responsible for them. See, that's that's the key. <laughs> you know, what fast decisions <laughs> that people don't have to take responsibility. Not me, not me, not me. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, all of this technology, all of this data, all of this artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things is built on top of cloud. Cloud is a foundation for business. So it's the growth pillar that all of this is going to be built on top of. And I'm talking about cloud native infrastructure and IoT as 5, 5G telecommunications technologies really liberate, you know, the virtual machines and the storage from the data centers and take it out to the edge. So mm. that's what's going to change everything. 5G for you and me. Don't be don't be scared of 5G, folks. All right. So, Ray, uh, what's some of your, your thoughts there? So, so I, I like the article. I think it makes sense for 2022. Uh, but when I look at 2030, I look at this very differently. Um, at that point, the metaverse economy will have taken over and digital goods and services will outpace physical goods. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm always wondering, like, are we overbuilding capacity right now because we're just trying to you know, compensate for 18 months of really just chaos? Right. Wow. And, and that's just backlog. And, and we're over expanding capacity to the point where as, as things become more digital and goods become more digital and, you know, I'm buying an NFT, I'm trading in the metaverse, I'm in a digital world. Right. A lot of my goods and services and transactions are handling in, in the Web3. Uh, and they're all DeFi and decentralized. Um, is it really necessary to double down on these things? And I'm kind of curious, like how much of it translates back into where the metaverse economy picks up. And so, mm -hmm. so I like the trends. I think they make sense for 2022, but I got to put my futurist hat on. And I'm like, in yeah. 2030, you know, I don't know that's going to be happening. <laughs> it's all going to be in the metaverse, right? So it's, uh, it's the industrial revolution all over again, right? When you went off the farm and went into the factories, yep. uh, then you left the factories with the information technology and went into the offices. And now we're leaving the offices to go home so that we can leverage the internet to work from home and operate yep. in the multiverse. Mm, and yes. there's, there's the transitions are becoming faster, more pronounced and global. So, so you're right. This may be good for 2022, but 2030 is not that far behind. And, and the digital economy, the virtual world is going to accelerate everything. Mm. I mean, Scott, Kevin, we're going to be doing this in front of like 10,000 people in a metaverse room. Like we could be in a Roblox room or an Epic Games environment like right yeah. now. And we'll be able to see everybody in the future. Right. It's it's, only, I mean, it's, it's the only way I'm getting my show's going to be there in two years. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's only way I'm going to get my son's attention. Uh, Ray, is if, if we do <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, um, <laughs> you know, one, one little one little uh, segment from this article. And we're referencing this article. Uh, let's see here. BCS, the Chartered Institute for uh, IT. It was talking about you know AIs, of course. It's not just everywhere these days, but it's talked about nonstop in every conversation these days, right? But I like this point here, key point that was made. Mm -hmm. If you do three things, number one, leverage it with complementary technology. Number two, really wrap it around customer-centered thinking. And number three, not just using it as a way to simply replace people or other technology. If you can apply AI with those three, a three legged stool in mind, it's going to truly optimize the powerful impact that AI can make. Um, yep. Ray, you're nodding your head. Would you agree or disagree? Oh, I definitely agree. I definitely agree. We're heading in that direction. And, you know, the more we accelerate that, um, the more data we can put in there, the more we can actually accelerate that and make sure we have precision decisions, right? What I'm worried about is the false positives, the false negatives, right? 98% accuracy in manufacturing, yeah, that's okay. 98% accuracy in healthcare, no, 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 that's not gonna work, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, your pills are 96% accurate, like, yeah. <laughs> <that's not gonna laughs> so, we need to have a dial tone yeah, accuracy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, all right, Kevin, your thoughts uh, related to AI or your final thoughts related to this piece? Well. AI should be used to enhance the human powers, okay? Humans can only, humans are great at a very small subset of things, but those are the things that we really need. So, and a note that you can't get from anywhere else. So yeah. leverage AI to enhance the capabilities of humans. And then we have to leverage education 
so that humans can realize the value of themselves, okay? So they can be, you know, um, self-actualized, right? Right. <laughs> that hierarchy again. <laughs> it, it, it's well, really Scott, there's a... We, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. We, we have a seven step method to do this, right? So when you look at highly repetitive tasks, that's going to be automation and AI, lots of volume automation and AI, lots of nodes of interaction. We can't multitask that well. Lot, you know, that's going to be automation and AI, massive time to completion, automation and AI. But where you actually insert a human is going to be interesting when we have highly complex mathematical models that can't be modeled in math. Right. Yeah. They still haven't figured it out. That's where the human judgment is going to come into play. Uh, when we have areas around creativity, we're really good at making the rules. Oh, but we're better at breaking the rules. Like <laughs> right incentives, we get really good. That's where creativity kicks in. And then there's last piece, which is where physical presence is needed. Right. You're not in harm's way. You're going to see humans in that place. And so those are seven ways to kind of look at, you know, when you apply automation and AI and when you actually use a human. I love that. You know, um, one of the things that, that uh, we've mentioned and kind of addressed or uh, um, touched on kind of throughout the conversation is that focus, the intense focus on the customer, right? It's interesting, you know, back in the 80s, voice of the customer, uh, Six Sigma, other methodologies really preached the value of that. And, and not just mm -hmm. 80s, going back certainly before that. But nowadays, it's also it's almost like you don't have a choice. If you're not really lasered in on, and focused in on what the customer wants, man, it's no longer optional. Uh, and that, that's probably a good thing. That's probably a good thing. Right. Um, okay. So Nerf, uh, Nerf going back to, um, he says my public weight disclosures are 6% accurate. So I have no problem with a value of 6%. Great to see you here, uh, Nerf, as always. All right. For the sake of time, Starkey, and, and <laughs> Kevin and Ray, uh, yeah. I'll tell you, uh, getting y'all two together, I think we could solve some of the world's problems. I wish we had another hour, but respecting y'all's crazy schedules, I do want to talk about this um, uh, well-received book uh, that you have recently released, Ray, well, I guess uh, probably a couple months back now, Everybody Wants to Rule the World, Surviving and Thriving in a World of Digital Giants. Now, transparency, we're talking about the value transparency. I have not, this is on my next uh, next to read list. I'm still working <laughs> through Dan Gingas's uh, great read uh, uh, that he released. But Ray, tell us, give us the cheat sheet. What are some of the core messages you want to communicate with this read? Yeah, I'll give you a quick cheat sheet. What happened? Um, if you look at the market cap of the digital giants we know, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, right? Uh, Microsoft, it was two trillion dollars in 2017. And you know, it's pretty big companies, right? Um, if you look at the market cap today, and add them up, it's 10 and a half trillion, right? Wow. Never before in the history of capitalism or companies in general, have large behemoths grown this fast, right? They quintupled right? They quintupled in four years, right? <laughs> Normally companies get big and fat and lazy and don't get stuff done. And, and that's really what I wanted to go back and look because I wrote a book in 2015 called Disrupting Digital Business. We described where digital transformation was going. We mm -hmm. set that up. And then in 2018, I started to say, hey, who was successful? Who wasn't successful? And we realized, Digital transformation isn't enough. There's a new type of business model out there. And so we define what a digital giant is, and then we define how to actually compete against a digital giant. And then we talk about how you regulate digital giants on wow. the back end. And so there's five things that you really have to know, right? The first thing is these companies are really good at disintermating customer account control. They have ways of aggravating your customers in a way that you wouldn't expect. A great example, food delivery apps, right? So, right. you know, your DoorDash, your Uber Eats, your Postmates, your Deliveroo if you're in the UK or Swiggy if you're in India, right? So, so the thing that's really interesting about them is in the middle of the pandemic, Every restaurant, every business owner gave up their customers. They handed them over to these food delivery app companies who then took the credit card information, now got all the transaction information. And the first place you go is not, you don't call the restaurant up anymore. You go to the food delivery app. Right. That's customer account control disintermediation. And they're really good at that. Expedia, trying to take that from the travel companies, right? Airbnb, trying to take that from disparate rooms. They Absolutely. aggregate really well. And that's the customer account control. The second thing they do really well is they build the biggest network, right? And they go from like hundreds or thousands of like mom and pop companies have cust you know, mom and pop co mom and pop companies have a thousand customers, right? Maybe ten thousand at best. These companies have millions through that aggregation. So they build the biggest network. So it's right. either your members, your subscribers, any connected device or machines, right? You want to figure out what your biggest network is because that's how they actually take the data and start using that data to be successful. And that's what we talk about competing on data supremacy. 
data is so important to them. And it's not just data. They're building what we call the business graph. Just like social networks have a social graph, it's mm -hmm. the intersection between a supplier, a customer, a partner, an employee with an object like an invoice, an order, or even a campaign or ad, and location, time. Right. Right? What's the weather like outside? What part of the process were you in? Where were you stuck? Right? What was your sentiment? Like they even want to know your heart rate. Right? And they get all that information exactly. and they use it to plan what they want to do next. And so let's go back to the food delivery app companies. They did a really good job, right? To the point where they're building ghost kitchens because they know that maybe in Kevin's neighborhood, like Italian food is doing better than like you know Greek food. Okay, great. Right. So let's go build a ghost kitchen here and serve that market. Right. Or Scott, like where you're living, maybe they do a better job, like. You know, your OTP and now OTP folks are going to order more one thing versus something else, right? <laughs> yeah, you get the right. idea. Like, it all comes together, right? And so they take that data and they win. But then it's the digital monetization that comes into play. And that's important. It doesn't matter who you are, right? Google, dominant player in search. Facebook, dominant player in social business, right? So Google has, you know, 4.2 billion people, you know, in terms of what they cover, right? Mm -hmm. Facebook has 2.8 billion members, right? Well, they're monopolies in their own right or dominant business models, but you know what? They're competing fiercely for digital ads, right? 130 billion for Google, 70 billion for Facebook, but guess who's number three in the ad business? Wanna take a guess? Kevin? Amazon? Amazon, 14.1 <laughs> billion, 14.1 billion last year. If you look at 12 month trailing, it's about 24 billion. Wow. So, wow. so they're now in the ad business. So we just took three different business models in the digital era, commerce, search, social, but they're all competing for advertising, yes. right? Yes. And that's what the crazy thing is. People don't realize the business models are just there, right? It has nothing to do, right? I mean, you're, you only have six ways to compete in the digital world, ad search, good services, or memberships and subscriptions. That's it. Right. Wow. And Amazon is firing on all six of those like anybody else. Right. So that's the digital monetization. And then the last piece, you got to have a long term mindset. You have to invest money. You, have to, you can lose money for 10 years, lose hundreds of millions of dollars and nobody cares. So long you're growing and you're going to escape velocity. You're getting to the biggest membership. Remember, Facebook was losing money. People, oh, they're going to go bankrupt. Amazon was losing money. Oh, they're going to go bankrupt. Right. Netflix was losing money. Oh, they're going to go bankrupt. Well, they got to escape velocity and now no one else can beat them. Right. And it's a very, very important point. So those five things come into play. Now, the reason I brought this up around the food delivery app companies was because the number one performing stock between 2009 and 2019 was what? Google, Netflix, Apple, Microsoft. Take a guess. What do you guys think? Uber Eats. Uber Eats. <laughs> <laughs> who else? Kevin, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, would, I would guess at Google. You know who it was? No. Domino's Pizza. Domino's, really? Pizza. Domino's Pizza. That would have been the last guess. I would never have talked about that. These guys won the battle for digital transformation. 17 ways to order a pizza. You can track the order of the pizza. It tells you where it is 10, day, 10 minutes away, 5 minutes away. It gets delivered. You take a picture of the pizza, run it through the AI bot, and they can tell you the quality of the franchisee. Like, I mean, they did everything right. Must but have been they're getting their right? butt kicked. <laughs> <laughs> but they're getting their butt kicked by the food delivery app companies. They actually had the first year-on-year -year loss in terms of – not loss, but decline in same-store revenue, same store sales, right? Mm -hmm. It hasn't happened in a while. It's because you order pizza maybe once a week, maybe right. once a month, right? You order from the food delivery app. Some people order three times a day. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, it's really interesting. Domino's has really transformed many things. And they've also, if you've had Domino's, you know, years ago and had it recently, they've also uh, improved their it pizza. Better. And yeah, it, it did taste, taste better. a little better. It really it's does. Not, okay. um, I don't want to bash <laughs> anybody, uh, but at least it's better. It's better. So Ray, it's it's fascinating. And I got to tell you, according to the chief digital evangelist at a little company, Salesforce.com, that everybody, <laughs> of course, has heard of, he says Wong's new book may be the most important business book. Of 2021, and that's uh, Vala Afshar, I believe. Yes, uh, so uh, that is high praise, Kevin. How about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know what Ray is is highlighting is the power of the network, right? Yes. That's these are being driven. These all of these digital business models are being driven by the network, network of information yes. and data. All right. Yes. That's at the heart of all of these. There is. I always say there are no industry verticals anymore, right? 
every business is about a data source and a data sink. And if you yes. can manage and identify the source, provide that conduit from the source to the sink, you will become one of these digital giants. Yep. And that's what we call data driven digital network. These are the multi sided platforms, these 100 year platforms that actually trade on that insight. And you're building multiple monetization models mm -hmm. off of that. And that's why having the biggest network is important because you want to bring the data into the network and the volumes there. Right now, everything that's being done piecemeal, you know, you have your own planning software, supply chain software, something, you know, demand planning software in your own environment, right. useless. Yep. And back to your point on where people are, I mean, we're collapsing data value chains, not industries. And so examples, comms, media, entertainment, and tech, it's really the same business. Whether I sell you a live stream or I sell you a piece of software or if it's games or if it's a movie or music, it's the same thing. I have a digital mm -hmm. asset. I send it through a technology platform. I have partner networks that push that stuff out. And I've got customers that come back and consume it with a digital monetization model. Wow. And that's it. They're really the same business, right? And retail right. manufacturing and distribution are now the same business, right? Mm -hmm. We see that as well, right? Healthcare, insurance, hospitality, hospitality, really the same business, right? <laughs> so we get crazy things like this popping up. So folks, check out the book, uh, Ray Wong's book here, Everybody Wants to Rule the World. We've already dropped the links, uh, Barnes, and Noble, uh, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, you name it, drop those links in the comments to make it easy. Um, I wanna share, <laughs> Man, Nerf keeps it coming. Nerf says he even gets the name of the person who made his pizza from Domino's, and he agrees. <laughs> Domino's pizza is a lot better now than it was a decade ago. Uh, and, and Avanesh is looking to benchmark. Hey, what about Pizza Hut? We'll, we'll have to have. <laughs> what <about> Pizza Hut? <laughs> we'll, we'll have to have the Pizza Hut supply chain customer experience uh, battle. The real uh, question the is Chick Fil A. The real yes, question Chick -fil -A. is Chick Fil A. The best freaking drive-through ever in the middle of a pandemic, and the okay. best mobile yeah. app. I got a question for you, Ray. So why isn't Chick-fil-A open on Sunday? <laughs> the Seventh-day Adventist, that's why. But I want to point out something, Kevin, on your end. The training is so incredible over there. The people uh, training that you were talking training, about, education. that human yeah. supply chain on their end is the best. I mean, they tag team to help each other. I, like, I've never seen. And it's like they're not like, I mean, this is high school training. I mean, <laughs> they're so organized. It's not right. like this is like professionals on it. They took people off the street, trained them, and got them to this level of customer experience. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah, Culturally Absolutely. driven, you know, for sure. Those, uh, lines and drive through are always long every day all day but they move but they move they, move they do and the, and the product is so consistent we, we could talk about the chick-fil-a uh model for hours on <laughs> that's true you're that so line actually <laughs> chick-fil-a edition digital transformation agree <laughs> talk about chick-fil-a <laughs> charles heater says this session was worth the price of admission scott luton great lessons fact-based examples i appreciate that charles always bringing the heat and glad you could make it today eric i think he's talking about our chick-fil-a discussion don't get me started <laughs> but you know it's so funny it is so funny. Spicy or not uh, spicy. Ch <laughs> Chick-fil-A <laughs> Chick has created, we're, we're, we're attesting to it, raving fans that that yeah. so believe in their, as much as their product as their processes, as how they do business. Um, it's really, it's it's an amazing. Uh, just, you know, uh, folks studied all kinds of companies through the decades, right? But, but Chick-fil-A, I think folks have been studying that for decades and decades to come. Okay, Ray, we have run out of time with you and Kevin what? really quick. Whoa, hard to believe. Hard, <laughs> hard to believe. Again. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Supply chain again. Sorry. Uh, but let's make sure folks know how to connect with you, Ray. Beyond the book. Perishable, we, perishable products. About. That's right. Perishable products. How, how can folks connect with you, Ray? Oh, simple. You can check out the uh, Constellation website, www.constellationr.com, personal website, raywong.org, R-A-Y-W-A-N-G.org, Twitter, at R-W-A-N-G-0, and LinkedIn, same as well, R-W-A-N-G-0. Wonderful. And, you know, he is in demand. He's a sought-after keynote uh, uh, principal analyst, uh, author, you name it. Uh, I'm convinced you've got several clones knocking out all the work you do, Ray. <laughs> but <laughs> that's the secret to supply chain. Oh, yes. Ray. A pleasure to have you here. Kevin, Ray was a home run guest, huh? Uh, absolutely. We'll have to have him back again. The next time is going to be a two-hour show. <laughs> I'm so humbled. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor. i got to have you guys on our show as well. Uh, we'll bring you in with uh, Vala as well on Disrupt TV. So, All Thank right. you, Ray. Have a great rest of your week. Uh
man, Ray was incredible. You know, Kevin, yeah. um, that was the first time, of course, he appeared on Supply Chain Now and Digital Transformers. But, man, he's got a vibrant energy uh, that is part of, of who he is, part of his communication. Mm -hmm. he, he gets you ready to run through walls, doesn't he? Oh, absolutely. But the um, the knowledge that he has, I mean, his sort of laid back character belies the, the, the network that he has, the knowledge that he has and what insight he has been able to draw from all of these disparate industries. Uh, I mean, this, this is fascinating. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm glad we could get him booked today and no, we'll look forward to reconnecting awesome. with him soon. Yeah. All right. So, Kevin. Um, of course, talking about busy folks, you've got a tons of thing, uh, tons of things going on. How can folks connect with you, though? Oh yeah, always on social media, Twitter, Kevin underscore Jackson, and Kevin Jackson on LinkedIn. But the best way is by subscribing to Digital Transformers on Supply Chain Now or on on the uh, podcast of your choice. We're on. Apple, we're on uh, Google, Amazon, all of them. Whatever you hear your podcast, you can find Digital Transformers. Well, uh, it is uh, a pleasure to collaborate with you and learn from you, Kevin. I'll tell you, you bring so much to the table and getting you and Ray together. Holy cow. Uh, <laughs> we could really solve lots of world's, pro world's problems. So, hey, connect with Kevin. Of course, connect with Digital Transformers. Check out the latest episodes there. Um, make sure you check out Ray's book. Everybody wants to rule the world. Uh, but most importantly, folks, I appreciate all the great comments we're getting in the skyboxes. I'm so glad that uh, you had a lot of folks tuning in here today. I'm, I'm, I hate that we couldn't get to everybody, uh, Kevin, but that's kind of the nature yeah. of the beast these days. But hey, folks, uh, most importantly, on behalf of our entire team here, and big thanks to Allie and Amanda and Clay behind the scenes helping to make production happen. Do the... Uh, do good, give forward, be the change that's needed. And with that said, we'll see you right back here on Supply Chain Now really soon. Thanks, Kevin. Hey, thanks, Scott. Bye, everybody.